September 10th, I had just come off for vacation and uh, I was in Pennsylvania Dutch and I actually uh, got home midnight. So I literally uh, went into my house, went into the shower, <laughs> got all my uniform stuff out ready because I have a 5.30 shift, so I get up at four o'clock in the morning. So I laid it down for about two or three hours to get up and go right back to work on September 11th. I was living in the city and every night before I went to sleep, because I had a really great view of the Twin Towers, so I could lay in my bed and right between my feet were the Twin Towers. So I would, I would see the twinkling lights and imagine the people working there. The night before 9-11, unfortunately, I was at work because I handled the international settlements. And I had to work on a very large trade uh, with Hong Kong. And having to work on their time frame, which were hours difference from us, I was there until 9.30, 10 o'clock. The night before was just like any other night. Uh, September 10th was uh, Monday night. It was unremarkable, normal, and uh, not particularly uh, unusual in any way. There was absolutely no sense of anything different that was uh, going to happen. And on September 10th, 2001, it was a proud moment for me. I returned to Tottenville High School, where I was a student, as a substitute teacher. It was uh, a rainy day, and finished up my normal 11-hour work days and got home roughly around 7 o'clock, 7.30, and sat down, had dinner. And there were talks of the weather clearing for tomorrow, and so that was nice. You wouldn't have to walk in the rain. I'm at work, and I, I think about the night before 9-11 quite a bit. Uh, I was working, I was working at 24, the night into the day. Um, so I get to the firehouse uh, Monday night at, for a six o'clock tour till the next evening at six o'clock. But yeah, I had uh, I'd changed my mutual around so that I could uh, I'd see my cardiologist about something. And I had to take my kids to school Monday. It might have been the first day of school, I'm not sure, at the elementary school. It was just a regular normal night, me coming home from work, taking care of the children. Just a regular routine night, nothing different. On September 10th, I was preparing for another work day in New York City. Yeah, I was um, working, um, I worked for a corporate actions firm. We'd actually agreed the night before to come to work an hour earlier. So that's something that definitely, wow. Um, it's definitely something that, um, that I remember. The night before 9-11, it was just an, another night, watching TV, uh, having dinner, um, going to bed early. Nothing really, just hanging out at home. Didn't go anywhere. Didn't work. Was doing the next day. It was the first week of school. I was uh, eighth grade. I was my last year at the school I was at. I was excited. We were the, the, the big kids on campus now. The night before 9-11, that's life before 9-11, so it's a totally different world. You just didn't realize it. I work for a virtual health system, and I was working um, a 911 um, ambulance, response ambulance. Um, took an extra shift for somebody, 4.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the afternoon. And uh, I was in the middle of that shift when, when we got the page. And uh, so I will never forget where I was. It was remarkably beautiful. A clear day, there wasn't a cloud in sight. So the cold front for that September, it wasn't really cold cold, but it's cold front nonetheless, had cleared the air of all of the pollutants so you could see forever clearly and sharply. It was this beautiful, extremely clear, perfect day. It could not be more perfect. Chris, clear, you felt invigorated. Very happy day, you know, very good day. And it was Beautiful day. The sun was out. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was dry, sunny, crystal clear, perfect late summer day. And I, my thought was, you know, how much better could it get than this? As far as the weather was a gorgeous day, the best day you could have ever seen. 
It was visibility. I said to myself, why am I going to work and I could go to the beach? It was beautiful. Spend the day with my children. Like uh, the guy said, low humidity, absolutely drop dead gorgeous day. It was a beautiful day. It was a very nice day. It was uh, clear skies. It was just maybe a puff or two of wind, just enough to comfort you. And it was just a beautiful, lovely, gorgeous Tuesday morning, absolutely normal, except that I was going in early. I could remember, you know, how clear a day it was and how beautiful a day it was and how there was nothing you couldn't see from, stat from the Staten Island side. It was such a gorgeous day. We were hiding underneath the trees because it was starting to get a little bit warm. And in the ambulance, you can get warm very quick. And I hate air conditioning. <laughs> I'd rather have fresh air than air conditioning. September 11th, 2001 was a beautiful blue sky day. It was unusually beautiful. And I noticed that. As the events unfolded, uh, they really came from out of the blue. And that's uh, literally and uh, figuratively speaking, uh, when these planes entered the tower number one, the North Tower, it was right out of the blue sky. No one could ever have anticipated. Uh, and in fact, when it occurred, it was uh, incomprehensible what had happened. Well, my normal get-up time was around uh, 3.30, 3.45 in the morning. Uh, allowed me time to uh, leisurely get prepared in the bathroom, of course, uh, with the shaving and showering and whatnot. Uh, walked down to the train station. Get there normally around 5 o'clock. Gave me plenty of time to start reading the paper. About 25 minutes trip into Newark and transferring to the PATH train. The PATH train is operated by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And of course, my destination would be the World Trade Center, which was another 22 minute trip. Got on the PATH train and um, came into the World Trade Center like, every, like I'd done every other morning. I took the, uh, the number one uh, subway, 7th Avenue line, as usual. Uh, there was a stop within the concourse of the World Trade Center. Just a regular day, I used to take the subway in from Penn Station, come into the World Trade Center, uh, take the elevator up. I, I remember seeing one of my neighbors who didn't make it. I got there maybe 20 minutes late. Everybody was, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel was packed, bumper to bumper that morning. So I know afterwards everybody said they were late, a lot of people. You know, I got on the bus. I would take the bus and get off basically right in front of Century 21 and walk through the plaza. There was the farmer's market that was going on that morning and I stopped and I bought a loaf of bread from the Amish bakers and I put it in my backpack which also had my computer in it. That day I decided I was going to take the 4-5 um, the down and I took the 4-5 down to Wall Street. Went to work. I was, uh, I'm one, of, I was one of the deans of the school so I was working in the uh, cafeteria at, uh, at the time for you know, uh, late breakfast, early lunch, whatever it was. My middle girl, Jackie, said, Daddy, you have to take me to school today. It's picture day. I said, well, get your rear end moving. It's 7.30. I got to be at work at 9. I dropped off at school at 8. Beautiful day. I got to work about 7.30 that day. As I was busying myself on the phone with uh, a gentleman from our London office, we made a connection to uh, Brooke from Cantor Fitzgerald to resolve the very same tree that I was working on the night before. So I proceeded, I went to the office and I followed the signs for Tower 2 and just as I'm doing right now, I pulled out my ID. And on the reverse side is the barcode that you put over the scanner. So it scans you in. I get off the elevator. I went to my desk, just like I did. It was around 8 o'clock in the morning. And I put my, my pocketbook down, like I have here. I put it down. This particular morning, uh, we were scheduled to make a demonstration of nine new doors on the observation deck that we had just put security access control systems in place on them. 
And we were going to demonstrate them to the manager of the uh, OBS deck for his approval to bring them into the system and turn them on for 24-hour duty. You get there, and as, as much of a hassle as it was in the morning, just going up that escalator and seeing Welcome to the World Trade Center was just, it was like a gush, you know? It was, it was a good feeling. As I'm walking into the building, I'm looking up at the building, I'm saying, oh my God, look how giant this building is. I've only been working here six months. I had my cup of coffee from the Roach Coach, <laughs> and then I went upstairs, started my day. And I went and I sat at my desk, and um, I logged on my, to my computer. Probably about uh, 8.15 or 8.30 thereabouts. And as usual, uh, I just turned on my computer, uh, reading email, and as I had done for many years, and still do to this day, uh, I was enjoying a uh, cinnamon raisin bagel and a, a cup of coffee. It was uh, very quiet, unremarkable. Normally in the mornings, we have a nine o'clock group meeting with the management. So I get ready for that, I get in about 8.30. Uh, I used to take off my shoes, get my coffee, drink my coffee. And then usually at about five or 10 to nine, my friend Brian would come down. He's also one of the senior managers. And then we'd go into the morning meeting, which was in a conference room, two offices from where I was. And I was on the 79th floor. I had a nice routine in my life. I was working, waking up every morning at 6 a.m., no alarm clock feeling good and ready to go. I, was, I looked forward to each day and going to work and doing a good job. And I remember taking the, the boat, the Staten Island Ferry, into Manhattan. I was on the 8 o'clock boat. The boat tied up in Manhattan at 8.30. And I got on the subway to go uptown, a couple of short stops. And when I exited the subway at Houston Street at quarter to nine, Things took a very big change. Uh, yeah, dispatcher. Yes. This is uh, off duty fire fighter Jermaine. I guess you got this already. But you got a plane crash into the World Trade Center. You aware of that? You have a plane that crashed into the World Trade Center in Manhattan? World Trade Center in Manhattan. Yeah, where are you going from? I'm on Varus Street in Manhattan. Barrett Street in Manhattan. Oh, it's the, it's the North Tower, World Trade Center. You are Tower? North Tower. You got... And the phone number you're calling from? Uh, I'm on a cell phone. I'm an off-30 firefighter. My name is Jermaine. Okay. Okay. The North Tower, Vichy Street. You got anything? Vichy Street, guys. Okay, thanks a lot. Send them all because you got a major fire on the upper floor of the World Trade Center. We heard something on the regular radio that um, plane went into the Twin Towers. And I just looked at Jen. I said, this is just not even funny. So the radios are all blaring at this point, saying there's an MCI, which is a mass casualty incident uh, at the World Trade Center, and it was a small plane into the tower. I watched. My pager went off. It was 8.46 that we were paged at exactly when the first tower was struck. Um, called my supervisor and he said, we already have somebody en route. Um, go home, get your dog. I looked up and I saw this huge hole in the side of the building. I didn't expect to see that big of a hole. I was astounded by it. Uh, I had worked in the building for five years and knew that that many floors meant that that was a tremendous hole. And if that was coming out that way, I could imagine that, you know, even the incoming hole would, would be tremendous. We felt this rumble. The building started to shake a little bit. We sort of looked at each other and said, what the hell is that? And about that time, the uh, radios went off. We've just been hit by an airplane, Tower 1. Big fireball, huge explosion. There's flames and smoke all over the place. There's debris falling. There are papers all over the place. When the first plane hit, it woke me up. So I was actually asleep, and uh, but I didn't know that's what it was, and and I looked around and I thought that something had happened, but I really hadn't heard anything. And then I looked out past my toes and I saw an amazing amount of smoke, and went to the window. And when you're that when you're that close, it looked completely different than on television, which I didn't turn on. 
uh, because you could see the flames. The, the flames were three, four, five stories high behind the windows. At that point, there was, it look, which looked like the sun that was going to come through our window. It was the explosion from the other building. I basically saw that and just ran. Uh, ran to the next stairway and just headed on down. I stepped off the elevator, um, and it must have been right at 8.46, because when I stepped off the elevator on my floor, and what I heard sounded like they had dropped something heavy upstairs. And I hear, bang, bang, and I felt the building sway. And then I look up, and I see the nose of an airline plane come through the tower across the plaza. I heard a blast about, it was about 7.45 or 8.45, 8.45. And um, all of a sudden, all my phone and Brooke said, what the hell was that? And I was like, I don't know. And I felt the building went to the left and came back to the right. And my coworker, Chris, pulled me and said, get down, we've been bombed. And then I continued to just, you know, head into the office, but before I could even get into the office proper, people started coming out of the office saying that a bomb had gone off somewhere. But then at about a quarter to two or thereabouts, you heard something and you looked out the window and you saw the people just scurrying out. They looked like ants coming out of the ground. And then I saw papers flying around, so it was obvious we didn't know what happened, but it was obvious something happened. The building rocked. Like in a train, you know, when a train center comes to stop, and you, that's, what the build, that's what it felt like. And, and that's when I think we, everybody changed. Uh, Somehow became aware that something had happened. This was just after 8.46 uh, a.m. when the first plane entered uh, tower number one. I looked out the window, and I, what I thought I saw was confetti rising going up and I thought this strange what I later realized was this was not confetti these were eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper but the enormity of uh, the and the scale of the buildings made it appear as though these were just small pieces of paper and I could see that tower number one was on fire and I could see the enormity and, and the extent of the damage. We just had a, a plane crash into the upper of the World Trade Center, transmit a second alarm, and start relocating companies into the area. The World Trade said that tower number one is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. It still wasn't, uh, the, the pulse wasn't beating too hard yet at that point. And then one of the guys, I guess the house watchman, came running in, and he goes, the South Tower was just hit. I saw the plane fly right up, right up the, uh, the East River, or the Hudson River part is there. And he goes, we're under attack. It's a terrorist attack. And I have to tell you, I felt like I got hit in the head with a hammer. I was like, why, did I see, why didn't I see this? What was I thinking? And uh, I was like, wow, really? And then we really started focusing on the news. But um, then we got the, the response ticket to go. We were signed on the fifth alarm for the South Tower. The second plane looked like it was actually coming toward us very very low me and him looked at each other and were like what is going on here and we watched the second jet tilt and make a u-turn almost over directly over the building we were at and we watched it heading toward the towers neither one of us could believe it uh, we watched and watched, and sure enough, the second, I was on the rooftop of the building uh, when the second jet hit the uh, second tower. The second plane hit while I was inside the building, so I didn't, I didn't see the second plane at all. And I knew nothing of a second plane until I went home. 
and was watching the whole thing played out on television. And while I was talking to him, the second plane hit. And it was a 60-story fireball that, that, that came at me. And it was astounding, and I couldn't speak. And so I just said, uh, I have to call you up and turn, turn the phone off. And I think I couldn't hardly make any phone calls after that, because then, then my phone went dead. And the plane hit right in the, uh, where our four floors. I think that my friend, uh, based on the facts that I, I know and you know, some personal facts I don't want to talk about because his wife told me, but um, he was instantly hit. He was at his desk and uh, when the plane hit. So I, I think it was instantaneous. There was no, you know. When, when we, we were watching the screen, when the second tower was struck, and that's when people really started like freaking out, but in a really organized way, in a way of, I need to get out of here. I would rather take my chances somewhere else than to just be a sitting duck. And that was really the mentality. By this time here, uh, the, the second plane does hit. Uh, we, we know it's an act of terrorism and it takes on a whole new complexion at this particular time. But I can assume that out of the many things that I felt and heard, uh, there were a series of them that probably took place around 9.03. The ground shuddered, the building groaned like I have never heard it groan before. And uh, I get a, another radio message that says, we've been hit by a plane. Tower 2, blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Say that again. Tower 2. And I said, okay, okay. I can't accept that. I cannot reconcile or accept the fact that there's a possibility of a second plane hitting. But at that point, I also, you know, not only was everything kind of like rumbling, but there was this noise that sounded like a freight train, really. But it was coming from the sky. And I remember looking up and looking to my left because that's where the sound was coming from. And I was expecting it to be, I don't know, a helicopter or something because, you know, the other building's on fire. So there's got to be people, you know, coming to rescue people. And what I saw was Flight 175. And it looked like it was going to hit the building that we were standing right in front of. And then it did, it kind of like did this dipping turn, like right at the last second and then slammed into the tower that we had just come out of. And I looked out and I saw the plaza filled with steel and glass and concrete and I thought, oh no. So I said, come on, Regina, come on. And just as, she, just as I finished that statement, tower to his head, and I felt the ground shake under my feet and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like the earthquake. And I looked at this watch and it was exactly 9.03. I think when we got on the 60th floor, was when the plane hit our building. And it shook, definitely felt the building shake. Now people are running down the stairs. There's coffee spilt on the staircase, trying to get down. Um, and these two men looked at me and said, if you wanna see your son, we need to get out of here. And they literally, arm for arm, pulled me down those stairs till we got to the bottom. If it wasn't for them, I would never be here today. But when that second, um, when the second tower was struck, that's when it, it really it came over us. Are we dead? Am I, am I having an out-of-body experience that I somehow know that I'm going to die today? And, oh, and I don't want to. In the time from I left the museum to the time that I arrived at the scene, there was another impact which I was not aware of, so now the incident became twice as large. It was already enormous. I knew when I saw the impact, I, kn I knew there was going to be many, many deaths. I knew there was gonna be many civilian deaths. I knew a lot of firefighters were gonna die. I knew that when I saw it. We had a, a large fire to fight, and we had 
a great possibility of losing a lot of people, especially at that time in the morning. I had worked there, and I remember seeing thousands and thousands of people coming in that trade center from the path train alone. You, you have this tremendous volume of fire. You have a logistical situation that is so high up in the air. How do you deliver the manpower and the, the water and all the necessary tools and equipment to begin fighting this thing, and you're fighting it from underneath. And we're just running down the stairs, and I'm going, oh my God, what's going on? And I'm smelling oh, smoke. I'm smelling like fire. Um, I'm going down, and I see a firefighter's coming up, and I, I, I said to my, you know, they're going up with the hoses on their shoulders, and um, so I said to one of the firemen, I said, what's going on? He goes, you don't want to know? Just get out of the building. The only thing in my thought was for me to get the hell out of there. I wasn't thinking about, oh, these poor people. I was just thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I need to be gone, you know? I saw a sea of humanity and people screaming and running. And I could hear announcements, but I couldn't hear what was being said because everybody was screaming. My file stopped at the seventh floor and we looked over, but we couldn't go further because there was an elevator that fell between the doors and the steps. And you could see people standing up like this, and I knew they were dead. You know, the plane hit around the 93rd floor, but in doing so, the plane took out all of their escape routes, the stairways, the elevators. They were all taken out by the impact of that aircraft. And they had only one more option, because if they weren't burned to death, killed on impact, or suffocating from the smoke, they had one more option. You make your peace with God, and you, you take that other option, or you stay with one of the other options. And that last option was to jump. And uh, we started going down West Street, and we're, we're looking right at the North Tower. The people jumping on the North Tower like crazy. I remember seeing debris and glass and stuff like that that you see in an office and body parts. I remember seeing a woman's calf from the knee down with a high heel shoe still on it. And it was just like, it was, it was surreal. It was from here down. And a nice calf and a high heel pump on it. And it was just sitting there like a prop. We just got caught up and the people are chained and jumping and you know, shaking your head like, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump. But in your head, you know, you're thinking, well, suffocate, burn to death, or jump. None of them are a good choice, but I don't think I would want to suffocate, and I don't think I would want to burn to death, so I would jump. But what I realized is that I was seeing pieces of the building, probably pieces of airplane, but at the time, all I thought of was build, you know, pieces of the building that were on fire. And then I realized that I was also seeing people. I saw many horrible things. There was jumpers coming around, around us. The ground was littered with body parts. It was pretty horrible. I was traumatized. As we're waiting there, you hear the young kids, oh, look at this, look at this. And it was the poor souls, you know, jumping. And I, you know, I didn't want to look, because you knew that they were in their last seconds of life. We were about to go back into the building and all hell broke loose. This is a EMS worker. There's been a major collapse. We need additional units forthwith. Our two has had a major explosion and what appears to be a complete collapse surrounding the entire area. This is a major collapse in the tower. The command center out here, everybody has to see. It was a major collapse. I'm in my wig right now. The South Tower now is starting to implode. The fireball is following us, so we're running away from a fireball towards Financial One. The fireball hit Financial One, sheared a part of it completely off, and the area we were in, that section entombed us with all the debris that was coming off of the South Tower as it was imploding. At this point, we're buried alive. There's no way out. Somewhere in proximity to the plaza of the South Tower, en route to entering the South Tower, when the building started to collapse. The building that was hit second collapsed first. So it went faster than the North Tower. At that point was when 
the first tower, our tower, started to come down. And I thought, this is it, I'm gonna die here. Uh, so uh, I started to run. And then we get this great tremble, trembling thing, you know, going on. And it's building two came in, coming down. I saw, said to myself, my God, you know. And then it came over the radio, our radios, that uh, yeah, the building two came down. And we were ordered to evacuate. Came back out and I just started taking some pictures when the first of the buildings started to fall. And uh, the person I know standing right next to me fell to the earth. And you could hear this this noise that came from everyone, this oh, this sound. And then it hit, and then you heard the rumble go through the subway. Actually, this one a black fellow walked through uh, uh, the uh, the park and yelled, uh, "The white man's world is coming down." <laughs> and it was like this moment where, because everyone was like half dead, there this this whole you couldn't imagine how many people were dying right now, and and it, where we'd lost. But I never thought it would collapse that way. I always in my mind pictured the building kind of toppling over it was when we looked up we saw the top of the tower rotate we could see from the bottom coming up this way and we could see the looks like what the floor was and this building but as soon as we captured that image it was totally obscured by this huge cloud that blanketed out everything and then the only thing we had was this tremendous rumbling roar like huge boulders an avalanche coming down a rocky mountainside. And then you hear this thunder and, and loud sounds and the building is starting to shake and vibrate. And the mind is racing and I'm saying, all these thoughts instantaneously going through. But there's another part of the mind that's operating too. And the back part of the mind is saying, hey stupid, wake up. That building isn't here. So we turned around and said, I think it's time to get the hell out of here. I watched the, the building the first tower come down uh, right from my school building after I had after I knew my brother was there. You heard the popping and then you just saw the tower leaning the south tower coming towards us and we ran. It turned black as night. Everybody started gagging, vomiting, you know, trying to get your mask on. I put my mask on. It was full of whomever and whatever. We watched on the screen as the first building tumbled down. And it was almost as if we were um, forgetful of where we were standing. It was as if we were watching it from somewhere else. It was surreal. Like, I can't even explain surreal. And as we're watching the building go down, our windows go, and it goes pitch black outside. And the only way that I've ever described it was it was as if somebody had taken black magic marker or black sharpie and covered all of our windows. You couldn't see. I thought it was the end of the world because blackness covered the entire downtown Manhattan. You could hear the sound of the upper floors, what we call pancaking. And at that moment, I believed that that was the end for me. And one of the guys says, hey, Cap, it's coming down. So I look up, and the top of the South Tower tilted right over us. It appeared to be right over us. Before it went down, as it came down, it started to tilt south. That's where we were now. Like John said, it started to pancake, and it was almost in slow motion. You could almost see it going floor by floor, like poof, poof, poof. And it only took like a fraction of a second to see all this. It takes longer to tell about it. But uh, you could actually see each floor just like slowly pounding. I remember tucking into the behind the buttress and putting my arm over the guy, the guy next to me, might have been Owen. And I, I, I thought, I thought a couple of things, and it was a split second. I thought, this is going to hurt, and there isn't really time to pray. And I remember my last thing was, so this is how it ends, and that was it. Even in my best day, I wasn't that fast a runner, and with all the gear on, I wasn't going to outrun the collapse of the building. There was no anticipation of me other than that I was sure I was going to die. 
I was expecting a big blast of energy. When I'm thinking, in my mind, I'm thinking this building, 110 story building is collapsing in front of us. I said, I'm probably gonna get blown to bits by the, the impact of it coming out. I felt all energy being drawn away from me. We were in some kind of void or, or in an area where the air, the air was being sucked back in. There wasn't much sensation around you. I had a, a Scott mask on. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't hear anything. The only process that I had was the thoughts in my head. And I kind of thought that maybe I, this is it. Maybe I, I died. We went to the North Bronx, and I remember it was pretty high, the Bronx uh, height-wise, looking down to the city. And we got there and went to the top of one of the buildings, and one of the towers had already collapsed. I could see the plume. And it looked so odd to me. Like, I know the city, and it, it just, I couldn't even believe what we were seeing. Oh my God, you believe this is happening, man? It went down. Yeah? It just went down. The whole tower just went right down. Look at my arms, how much goosebumps are on me, dude. It exploded. And now I don't see the other tower. There's only one standing, isn't there? The one on the right's gone. Our breathing was getting more raspy and more raspy and more raspy. And I remember saying to myself, you know, God, just take care of my family, my friends, and whoever else is out there. Because we were pretty convinced at that point we were going to die. Because we know, especially with our training, that superheated air and a closed area does not hold oxygen very long. It didn't occur to me that we were still alive because I really thought we were dead. And I, I really resigned myself to the fact that we were gonna die and be found standing up, all 30 of us. And then all of a sudden, I hear people screaming. And then I, I feel, I feel, I see smoke. And then I see like a fireball come up a street. And then I'm seeing, I'm feeling wind. And when I tell you this wind was like a tornado, people were starting to hold on to the, I had to literally hold on to a lamppost. And I couldn't see it from where I was. So I wasn't too sure what it was. And I see this man holding on to the lamppost. I had to hold on to it too because I couldn't stand up. It was like I was, it was like strong wind. And then I'm saying to myself, oh my God. And everybody's screaming, run. The smoke started coming more and more. And I just, I just kept running. And then I'm saying, oh my God, oh my God, I don't want to die, what's, what's, what is this? And then I just kept saying my prayers. I didn't realize how strong my faith was that day. And you could see down the side street, we just run, you could start to see the blowback from the collapse going down the, the my, peripheral, my peripheral vision. The side streets, you could start to see go down. And then black, blackness and soot that you couldn't breathe. Normal smoke, you go up, even if it gets thick, you can breathe it for a while. Couldn't breathe it at all. I was still saying the top of the building fell off. I was like, nah, it's just the top. The top came down, because my last glimpse was it tilting, and I'm thinking, man, the top 30 floors came off, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the guys were telling me, this, this, he goes, no, the whole building came down, the whole building came down. So we're waiting, it was still pitch black outside, and we finally ventured out it was like snowing outside, it was just white, it was a white haze, and it was eerily quiet. My handy talkie, I hadn't heard a thing since then. I tried to get on handy talkie and uh, say 220 to command, 220 to, I changed stations, nothing, nothing. Can anybody hear me? I'm a civilian, I'm trapped inside of one of the fire trucks, underneath, I collapsed, I just And as I crawled deeper, deeper in, everything started to shake and I got trapped, pitch black, the stuff came in behind me and I'm stuck in this hollow and um, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, screaming, no one heard me, nothing and I, I really thought I was going to die. I, I thought this is it. But I went through that horrible panic, confined space, and I was trained for confined space. I remember I, I prayed to God, uh, and I wasn't a religious guy or nothing, but I guess that's the time, you know, like, this is kind of it. Please, you know, don't let me suffocate here. Take me quick, and uh, somehow let my kids know that I was doing my best down here. That was like, came to my mind. And, 
just when I said that, I mean, this is my life-changing moment while I was there, um, I had the gift of holding my three infant babies in my arms. Like, I actually, like, we're sitting here right now, naked, beautiful, my three kids, a boy and two girls, and the smell of the baby smell was on them. And that was so unique to me because there was nothing but the horrible, putrid smell of death at Ground Zero. It was anyone who you're going to talk to will recall of all the things that smell. So now I'm smelling babies and holding them and seeing them. So to me, it was real. And God was with me. And I realized for the first time, he doesn't come from far away. He's inside of us. And you just ask him to be with you. And he's there. And I said, look, I'm ready to go. But... If you allow me to stay, I'm making deals now, um, I promise to dedicate my life to serving you. Whatever that is, I just, that was it, came out of me. Something told me that I had to go further down. I don't know why, it's the opposite reaction of, of where I should go. And it kind of illuminated, go this way. And I kept crawling down and feeling my way over and under and through. So I eventually made my way south, and I came up under the lobby of the Deutsche Bank building, which is one of the buildings they just took down, across the street. I have no idea how I got there. I came up through the sub-basement and uh, opened the side door, and all the lights of Ground Zero were shining, and I just looked and said, thank you. We're on 57th and Westside Highway. Let us go down west and get back to you. Let you know what's going on. First Charlie, the operations post, the command post is going to be set up on West Street. They're moving completely out to West Street. This is correct. I'm in contact with uh, G4 Army Base. Uh, Charlie, we're going to have to move out of here. Let's go get a bunch of the guys that are going to be working on the site. Let's go get them out of here. 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 Let's go get them and when we got there, I think we're still deciding whether or not we should do a search or we should head to the water. A little gray there, but I knew we, had to, we wanted to get over to the other side of the, uh, the financial area. And uh, with that, we felt the rumbling again. And uh, that time, we kind of we just knew that was the North Tower coming down. I think one of the guys mentioned it. That's the North Tower coming down. And uh, we headed down that street that we were on and, and ducked into another building a little later than, than this one and uh, waited for the same thing, blackness, waiting for it to end. Um, and that was just the start of it. It was stuff like that for the next, I don't know how many hours or minutes, I have no idea. It seemed like an eternity. It seemed like running from one place to another. Um, just debris all over the place, like snow and quiet. Yeah, that's how the morning went. We walked to West Street. I guess we got a block down, and you could hear the rumbling. And we ducked into a, a hotel. And then you could see just a cloud of black again. And people asking, what do we do? I told the one lady, cover your baby up and get on the Staten Island Ferry and go west. Get out of the city, don't come back. Leave as soon as you can. From what I understand, it registered as an earthquake somewhere in the United States, a three-point something. We were all stages of shock, and uh, Owen Carlock then suggested that if the South Tower came down, that the North Tower was going to collapse also. It was a very wise thought. I think we were in 75 West Street when the North Tower collapsed, and we knew, we knew what it was. We knew what happened. I was in shock. I was a total shock. It was my worst fear. It happened. It happened, and I was shocked. We started moving towards uh, where our, our sector was, and the ground started shaking again, and all of a sudden, it sounded like train, tornado, bomb, all at once. It was just overwhelming. The second tower had just fallen and we were running for our lives again.
and I was about 30 yards, maybe less, from the building, did I hear the building start to crack. And I looked up, and I saw it. I saw it starting to come down. And I started to run, and I said, I can't outrun this thing. And I'm thinking in my mind, of course, I can't outrun this thing. And I dump on myself, jump underneath the fire truck that was there. I had no anticipation that it would, I would survive. I had no thoughts that the building falls down on that fire truck. I'm not surviving. There's no possibility. I'm going to get crushed anyway, you know. So of course it didn't surprise me when I was that I was unconscious. And then it came too. At first. I thought I was dead. It was a very spiritual experience. Rather beautiful, it was just light. Clear, bright, white. Was there once a time When the world was young and unafraid When we sang of wondrous dreams And were proud of all we made Was there once a time When the world was wide and true and real each word was fresh and free, and each life was held and healed. Was there once a time when the song came lightly to my lips, and the music danced and played in a kind of trance, kinship once upon that time? If the world breathed heavy on my back I could find the strength to sing I would find a right lyric And unbeknownst to me at that time, one of the fatalities that occurred by somebody jump, jumping was Father Michael Judd, who was the chaplain of the Fire Department of New York. Sometime later, I would find his helmet, carry that with me on my egress. When I had seen some of the pictures come through of uh, some of the folks who had been injured, I saw that one of them was Mike and he didn't look good. Uh, and it turned out that Mike had died giving last rites to a firefighter who had been hit by a jumper. And he was hit by a jumper. So Mike was carried to uh, St. Paul's Chapel and they laid him on the altar. And uh, he's a saint. I really miss him.
He was the nicest, most kind, loving person in the world. You know, he, he did everything for my brother and I. He was always around. I know his calling in life was to be a firefighter, but he loved being a dad. People die when they're supposed to. I can't even imagine seeing him grow old. I can't imagine him becoming feeble. I mean, we were as close as, as you could possibly be. <sighs> he had a calling. I mean, it's what was supposed to happen. He died a hero. You can't measure grief. Um, you can't say my pain is worse than your pain. You can't um, measure someone's loss. You can't measure someone's love. Got to the point where I had to pick and choose which funerals I was going to go to. I just couldn't go to all of them I wanted to go to. I went to 27 different funerals for the guys and um, they were, each one of them was gut-wrenching, you know? And you think you get um, callous and, and immune to it, but you don't. I, I know I, I thought I cried every tear out. You know, I said, I, I, how am I still crying for these guys? Like, I didn't think there was anything left. People, and I think Americans, can get through almost anything. There's really not much that you can, the spirit that people have when things are down, no matter how, dark and you might feel things are down, um, just persevere, things, things, things will get better. But I think the majority of people who did what they did and answered the call on 9-11 at Ground Zero, I think they're, uh, they're a great tribute to America. They are the American tribute, like that's who we are. That was one of the hardest parts, too, dealing with the aftermath. Seeing the newspaper the next morning, seeing all those pictures, um, seeing a, a photo of someone I used to work with uh, years back, someone that worked at Buchanan Fitzgerald, seeing the pictures, and I said, oh my God. Like for a few seconds there, I forgot what happened. Then I seen the paper and I said, oh my God, I'm looking. And I'm saying, Jesus, this really happened? This, I, I don't understand it. This really happened. It's, it's, it's horrible. It was a total, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for me for a long time afterwards. Dealing with the fact that they, that I survived and they didn't. It's a very hard thing to deal with. And I said to myself, why? You know, you wonder why, you're grateful. You're thanking God you survived. But why did those people go when I survived? And you have to deal with the guilt. And it's not an easy thing. For a long time, I held on to a lot of guilt of the decisions I made that day, you know, life and death decisions, along with my partner, Jen. I've thought I wish I was killed, absolutely. I've thought that. I wish I was one of them. I'm glad I'm not one of them. I wish I was one of them. I should have been one of them. Maybe I didn't do my job enough. Maybe I should have went to the South Tower earlier. I thought I was gonna die, and I didn't. And I'm still de dealing with that every day. Uh, it's a good thing, I'm glad I'm here. And I'm trying to be productive with my life, and I think I am. And I know that I was spared that day for a reason. It wasn't my time. They didn't get me then, and they're not gonna get me now. It is by no means my doing to being here today. And I attribute the fact that God has called me for or, or spared me for bigger and better things. You can't live your life in fear. And so 
I live every day as if it were my last day. Not all of self and none of thee. It's all of thee and self will do. This is history. This was history. We have fighting in Ireland and we have fighting in Israel and we have fighting in Libya and all over, but it's not home. We don't live with that fear of going outside the door and something getting blown up or attacked. And that changed the face of history. Now it has come home and it's hit us very hard in the face. That day or that week, those months, I saw the root of what this country was founded on. The goodness, the, the compassion, the volunteering. And I was so very proud amongst all the tragedy. I was so, so proud to be part of, of this. I learned that things weren't quite as important. I didn't need the biggest house. I didn't need the newest car. I really opened my eyes up to what was important in life. I just um, wish people would take the time to stop being stop in their busy, busy lives and look at what they have and be thankful for what they have because there's always somebody worse and we have so much here. You know, love your family, hug them 10 times more than you ever did because the real things that matter are those things. I made millions in my aerospace life. I traveled the world, I stayed at the best hotels, first class, you name it, and drove the most beautiful cars. And I thought that's what life was about. That's what we're striving for, right? To get as much as we can. Now, Monica and I, we struggle to make end, ends meet, but there's a love that God's blessed us with that's it's so far beyond anything you can dream of. But it's because you've followed through those footsteps of that tragedy and you do realize what's important and then God gives you that gift. There is a huge lesson that was learned uh, working at Ground Zero and that was America coming together as one group. But we as Americans, we cannot forget what we consist of and what we still have and we forget that we're going to be forgotten and we're going to, we're going to forget what we're about and we're not gonna have that position anymore. And we, we, still, we still do, and we still can even more. And that's something that I, I think we all worry about and we all are concerned about, especially if you have kids or if you don't have kids, you're still here surviving. 9-11 has given America, it's a wake up call to say that there are enemies among us and they need to be identified. The World Trade Center was an event that the enormity of which was unprecedented, the loss of life uh, was uh, incomprehensible, and it was an event uh, given the, the media and the coverage that brought the entire world together. We were all focused on this event, and I believe that we should remain focused. My message would be that, uh, well, that hopefully that we can all learn from this and that somehow, through some miracle, that we can all live in, in peace. It's kind of unreal, the whole experience. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and think, this didn't really happen, but I know it did. And uh, as I stated, I'm, I'm glad I'm here and I'm very happy that I was given the opportunity to do my job with very good men and that we did our job and I'm very proud of that. God allows us to do this and that's why our money says in God we trust and everything this nation is from its founders. I think once we turn our back collectively on God, God forbid he turns his back on us because without him, this nation and our way of life is nothing. And again, this is no particular religion. This is just knowing that there's something so much grander and more magnificent than we could ever hope to be. And once we think we're the tops, we're going to the bottom. And so I am deeply thankful to have been part of this experience to relate it to others, to tell, to say that 
there is always hope and that through adversity we can become much uh, more satisfied in, in our lives and appreciate all of the wonderful uh, freedoms and, and privileges in this great United States. To whom much is given, much is required. Those men and women, all of us have been given so much, even if it's not tangible. We have been given a home or a place called America, a land of freedom, and it's worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for.